Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Justin Ward, and today I'm speaking with Deborah Fox, who is Head of Demand Management at Transport for West Midlands. Deborah is leading a project using innovative video analytics to find better ways to manage congestion. This is funded by a 2.65 million grant from the Department for Transport and is one of just eight projects nationally, the Live Labs program. This one is about driving innovation, supporting sustainability and improving safety. Briefly in kind of context terms, as the UK went into lockdown and we saw traffic volumes fall, uh, they've since then risen across the country. Has this been the story in the West Midlands? Absolutely, Justin. And we saw a resumption to pre-COVID-19 traffic levels just before the schools reopened in the region. You're head of demand management. Mm. Do you see, I mean, although it's truly ghastly COVID-19, do you see a kind of silver lining in terms of demand management in the sense that now people are working from home, people can retime journeys going into workplaces or going into shops? Do you Mm. see some kind of opportunity there? Um, I I think as a professional working in demand management, you always look for the positive opportunities coming out of any any major event that's having an impact on the network and the sort of things we've we've dealt with all sorts of incidents um, over the past uh, past few years and also really positive events, you know, sort of stadium events and things like that. So we, we have quite a broad experience now in the region of demand management. I, I do feel the the tension in the system is is mainly the capacity on public transport, and so you know in a in a normal event, for example, say a Commonwealth Games, if you were doing it a, a to demand management around that, you would have full hundred percent capacity on all your public transport, and and you would be able to uh, remode a lot more people. So the tension I think in this in the the, the current event, if you like, the pandemic is that we have a a limited public transport capacity. And so we've had to mobilise additional transport, for example, in uh, in respect of uh, getting the schools to reopen again in in September successfully and get scholars back in safely. But um, obviously a lot of trips have been removed from the network in in terms of people working from home. However, I, I, I go back to what I said earlier around the traffic levels having come back up to pre-COVID levels. The only thing that's really changed for us in the West Midlands is that the peaks have flattened. And so those uh, normal traffic peaks around school opening times, business opening times, and then the end of the day, that has flattened. I think that that is a pattern that um, we've seen in many other places across the country, certainly in, in our neighbouring county authorities. And can you tell me about the project itself? When was the decision taken to go ahead with it and what's been happening since then? It's been some time in the making and there was a pitch to a den of dragons uh, with, uh, who made the decision on this project, which was uh, well over a year ago now. And um, it's a really exciting pilot project. And we're working together with Birmingham City Council and Solihull Metropolitan Borough Council to really lay the foundations for a smarter and better connected transport network in in the West Midlands. So as you mentioned, Justin, we're using innovative video analytics and we're working to find better ways to manage congestion and, and keep the West Midlands moving. Now, those operational solutions are some way off. We will be running the project uh, to the end of November 2021. However, you know, during the pandemic, we have been able to trial and test some techniques and develop things like a COVID-19 dashboard with all the, the data feeds that are coming through and start to find operational solutions to help people keep moving and to help address congestion, help keep the West Midlands moving overall. Briefly, I mean, the interventions, I, I was just thinking if someone was listening to this who didn't know much about the topic, what kind of interventions can you implement to manage congestion? Mm. What, what are the types of things that, that seem to work? The kind of interventions you might see, if it, if it was to manage background congestion, you could run uh, messaging through a particular corridor or to 
people who've signed up for alerts, for example, and we've just started in implementing email alerts from Transport for West Midlands for those who want to receive them, which sort of takes our messaging a stage further di- directly to people who are consuming them. So uh, communications is one intervention with a number of different scenarios to retime, reroute or remote journeys. There might be other more operational solutions. So on an event basis, it, it might be around traffic management, for example, interventions that local authorities might be able to do around specific uh, traffic lights, traffic light changes, um, other, other really sort of hyperlocal traffic management interventions. Or in many cases, because we have such a large investment program going on in the region, you know, some some of the um, some of the places we're working in uh, are are going through a period of change over one or two years. So you could be looking at quite large scale mitigations around the investment program to help uh, people to keep moving. So uh, using the analytics, we'll be able to see what's happening on the network rather um, sort of in real time rather than just taking what the model has told us maybe a few years ago when the scheme was being developed so we can see in real time what's happening and and really put in additional interventions uh, more swiftly perhaps than some of the the more physical interventions that you would around an investment scheme. There are other live lab projects underway you mentioned that this is one of eight another one is looking at congestion but they're looking at different different data feeds aren't they That's right, Justin. So the Network Resilience Live Lab is utilising ANPR technology. And we're really looking at how we and local authorities around the country can maximise the use of their fixed assets and use ANPR technology in this case to maximise those fixed assets and uh, get the most from them. And we're uh, perfectly aware that with limited budgets these days, a lot of local authorities have cameras on the network but are struggling to create the business case for their maintenance and and, uh, and for their longevity. However, in, in the West Midlands, we have very well established CCTV control centre. And so we really want to see if we can utilise those fixed assets a lot better uh, for us and local authorities who have, uh, in some cases, have contracts with us uh, to deliver their CCTV capability and, and services. So, We have constructed a COVID-19 dashboard to take in some of the data from these cameras. And specifically, this is the West Midlands Police ANPR cameras. We're working really closely in partnership with West Midlands Police using this technology. And so the camera sites have been brought online and the data from the cameras has been fed to a server run by Amazon Web Services. Then that data is absolutely appropriately anonymised. So no personal information is available to us. And we're able to classify the vehicle in terms of ownership type, body type and fuel type. And that that's all. So that really allows us to understand the road usage changes during the pandemic and help decision makers to understand what's happening on the network. And the main challenge for us has really been ensuring coverage across the network when the camera deployment as part of this pilot project is only partially complete. But we can make up the shortfall with other additional data sources. So I suppose the tangible difference between ourselves and the Reading and Thames Valley Live Lab is that they are utilising mobile phone data exclusively uh, to explore video analytics. So later on in our projects, we'll be able to compare and contrast the two techniques from various different bases like cost, but also effectiveness and long term usefulness to us as organisations. And is this project linked to things, major events and major infrastructure underway? So what are the connections to HS2 in the mindsets of why this has been looked at or the Commonwealth Games in 2022? Well, that's right, Justin. And we took as a, a, a one of our first principles was to identify routes that were undergoing significant change in order to deploy the video analytics and learn from those routes in the run up to major events. 
We have the Coventry City of Culture in 2021. We have the Commonwealth Games coming up in 2022. And we also have a multi-billion pound investment going on in a region which is by nature causing disruption to some routes where new infrastructure, in some cases transport infrastructure, is being installed. And so being under, able to understand these routes in real time, really, really important to us as, as we go through this investment period in the West Midlands. So the, the choice of routes um, to deploy the AMPR cameras on and to generate the video analytics was ab absolutely tailored to routes where we wanted to make a difference in future through operational capability in our regional transport coordination centre. And how much does the data help potentially with considering new routes? So looking at maybe the new Sprint bus rapid transit system or metro routes, is is the things from the data that might help to, to identify whether there'll be value in those? I could potentially see uh, the data and our approach in this pilot project um, being informative to future investment schemes. However, you'll appreciate that a huge amount of uh, modelling, um, advanced consultation and engagement and uh, political decision making has gone on before transport schemes actually hit, hit, hit the uh, construction phase. And some of that work takes you know, a good sort of uh, 10 years to materialise. So it certainly wouldn't make a, an impact in initially. However, I, I feel that as we go through the pilot project and understand the customers on the West Midlands network even better uh, through a set of granular personas that we're starting to develop, we can then bring together the data and intelligence on the network and what's happening in real time. Add to that what we understand about our customers and how they'll react to things like communications messaging, for example, and then pull all that together and help to inform future interventions on the network, whether they be temporary interventions around demand management and things like retiming or, or rerouting traffic um, through to possibly long term interventions around infrastructure. And what about preparations for connecting and autonomous vehicles? Is the validity to the work that you're doing with this trial for that? I, I believe we're quite unique in the West Midlands in having a future transport zone and a live lab, an Adept Smart Places live lab. And so we've been able to decide which, which parts of those relate to each of those uh, projects and, and their funding streams and, their, and then be able to link them up. So I would say that the Network Resilience Live Lab is about current network solutions. So by nature, it's in 4G rather than 5G. It's about using fixed assets better. And it's about helping to manage traffic on the network, especially in the coming few years. Whereas your autonomous vehicles, uh, you might say that's a technology that's coming in a little bit further of a, a further time scale. So it's more appropriate to look at that in the future transport zone. But what does unite them is how people's preferences are changing in their use of transport and, and, and also their choices in travelling per se, whether they're choosing not to travel at all or to use one uh, transport mode over another. And so this is really exciting for us because then we can we can match up those outputs from the future transport zone with what's happening in, in the live lab as well. So. Yeah, so so I, I I would say it doesn't the live lab doesn't directly have an impact on the work we're doing on autonomous vehicles. However, the routes that we're looking at for the ANPR technology, they will be routes where autonomous vehicles are implemented. And I think a further angle also is our real will to link up with the wider uh, strategic route network with Highways England. They are in, a, I suppose, a much more advanced state of using video analytics and, and, and that sort of management of traffic out on the network than we are on the key route network. And, you know, being, being able to draw some of that understanding of technology and, and video analytics through into our uh, regional and then local road network is a really exciting prospect. So it gets I get the sense that there will be wider applications for this trial more widely across the UK. Is that where you see it going, that there would be an upscaling from it? 
Yeah, I mean, right from the outset, ours has been a live lab, which is uh, designed to produce operational solutions. It's not a research project as such. You know, it was always intended that we would um, create operational solutions in the West Midlands. However, uh, we do feel there's a lot of learning to share uh, that's coming out of it. And one of the requirements of all of the live labs was to share their knowledge, to create ways that other people can learn from from them. So we've started to disseminate some of that work. And today is, is one of those examples. And that will grow. The more that comes out of the pilot project, the more we will uh, package up and, and share with uh, professionals with both a technical audience and also a lay audience because I feel it's really important that everyone gets the opportunity to learn and so many of us as professionals are really coming into the data and intelligence world for the first time and and really starting to embrace it that it's important that we have the ability for every everyone in the professional sphere to to learn and apply some of these new technologies and as well as sharing the all, all the good bits or all, all the positive learning we'll be sure to share some of the things that haven't worked so well and also an understanding of where we feel some of these technologies should should lie and we may come to the end of the project and feel that really you know video analytics is something that should be applied regionally rather than locally for example for the economies of scale and and cross cross boundary challenges or we may feel that it's it is or it isn't a good prospect to use fixed assets so there, there'll be so much learning coming out of the project and we we really look forward to sharing that with with professionals and those who are learning to embrace data and, and analytics as part of their work it does seem about using an asset for for other purposes yeah like because obviously as you said it's the police network so they use it for their purposes but this is going actually we can use this in another way yeah. and then thinking about all the benefits from that so mm. uh, communications messages and looking at more granular data on who's using the network how the network's been used obviously yeah. anonymized yeah. that's quite interesting it does feel like there's probably quite a lot of scope within that data depending on how far you can dive into it mm. to know more detail about how the network's operating I mean, it's it's really our, our mission through our regional transport coordination centre to have that real time view of the network and to be able to monitor the interventions that we, we may put in for demand management, uh, whether they be sort of short term or, or long term. So the Network Resilience Live Lab is really making a huge contribution to that, sort of bringing innovation into the into the RTCC. So, uh, yeah, watch this space. Great. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing how the trial progresses as things develop. So that was an interview with Deborah Fox, Head of Demand Management at Transport for West Midlands. Thanks again for listening. If you're interested in this, you can find out more about the ADEPT Live Labs program online. So in 2019, in January, ADEPT, that is the Association of Directors of Environment, Economy, Planning and Transport, which represents place directors from county, unitary and metropolitan local authorities, secured £22.9 million funding from the Department for Transport for the Smart Place Live Labs programme. Eight Live Labs projects led by local authorities with university and private sector partners are piloting innovation across smart communications, transport, highways, maintenance, energy, materials and mobility. We have another podcast with the programme director, so please do listen to that if you're interested. Thanks again for listening.